So we're going to apply our initial conditions. So let's go ahead and write out TB of T1 plus T. So I think we're using this TB of T over on the right side. And I'm just going to apply that. So we have 68 plus 30.6. E to the negative. Now it's not negative kT. I'm replacing T by T1 plus 1. So we're replacing T by T1 plus 1. And this should equal 70 degrees. And let's see. So that's one of the two equations we're going to have. And the other one, written somewhere, so I'm going to translate. So we just did that second condition right there. Now, the first condition, I didn't actually write down the equation. So the first one's underlined above. TB of T1 is 72, so that's 68 plus 30.6 e to the negative k t1 equals 72. So there's what our initial conditions look like. So they're both, the initial conditions are underlined, and then down below is what they look like in the actual uh, function, our specific functions in this case. So any questions on that idea? We're just looking at the left half of the screen and our two initial conditions that were written out nicely right there turned into those two down there. So that's all that happened. So we got two equations, two unknowns. So in a perfect world, we'll get exactly one solution, hopefully. Generally, each equation, if you got 20 equations, 20 unknowns, if everything works out, you could get one solution out of there. So we got two equations, two unknowns. So go ahead and see if you can solve for, we need to know both k and t1. So test your algebra skills. See if you can solve for k and t1. What's a good um, solution method to use? And don't say matrix, this is very not linear. So you can't use any linear algebra stuff. Mathematica, it's a reasonable choice. Substitution. Yep, substitution. substitution. Elimination is another option, but subtracting these is not going to work out so well because you've got to mess around in the powers. Although I see a way, if you do a little algebra, you could use elimination very nicely. So I just did a tiny bit of algebra on the first two equations to flip them into this form. And I saw that I could have almost the same thing if I was careful with my exponents. So I just turned the second equation. I'm solving for uh, either. The, so I'm going substitution, except I don't really necessarily need to use ln inverse. Uh, 
or uh, ln here. Okay, I thought you were dividing one equation by the other. I'm doing substitution, but I'm not going all the way gotcha. and solving for either k or t1. Gotcha. I'm so, yeah. substituting in an expression, not just a variable. You don't have to use log base two. You can use LNs in a few different places if you want to. It's up to you. And does anybody have a calculator that can do log base two? Or if you can't do log any logs, you can write it as. whatever base uh, log you have in your calculator. I did something a little tricky. I used the fact that negative ln x is x, uh, ln x to the negative first, which is ln 1 over x. So negative ln is the natural log of the reciprocal. So I've used that a couple times without saying so. Two point nine four. So according to this, it's been there for almost three and what units? Probably hours. Mm -hmm. Somewhere we use an hour. Yeah, one one hour. What that was that plus one was an hour. So this is um, T one is almost three hours later. So that seems pretty reasonable for a whatever degree drop, twenty thirty degree drop or so. Not an expert on body cooling, but <clears throat> okay, algebra or calculus questions. We're all okay with algebra and calculus. You lost me for like a split second, but then as soon as I like, I did a few a few skipped a few steps here. Yeah. Some natural log stuff. I kind of just jumped right through. Uh, so if we look at the, in, I think you get more intuition out of the original differential equation than you get out of the solution. So if we look at the original somewhere that we circled right here. So this tells you how the temperature changes if you know the difference in the body and the surrounding, the, they call it the medium, but the surrounding area temperature, the ambient temperature. <coughs> And so if you notice, when these two numbers are very close together, the change in temperature is very, very small. So as the body gets closer to the room temperature, the amount of change is very, very small. 
Uh, theoretically, if, with this model, the body will never actually be the same temperature as the room. It will just asymptotically get closer. But it'll get close enough. Yes, uh, in addition to the fact that the room's never going to be a constant temperature, it's always going to vary a small amount. So it'll get close enough so that the variation in the room will be larger than the difference of the two. All right, so that's the end of word problems for now. Oh, first order of word problems. We'll do second order word problems later. So we're going to a brand new section. This one is just complex numbers. There's probably a different name in the book, but it's basically complex numbers. Are we skipping 16 Yes. Hopefully you remember a couple things about i, square root of negative 1. You're not allowed to forget that. We can define the complex numbers as a set. There's a few ways to define it. Uh, let's use, we could write them as points such that x and y are real numbers with weird Multiplication. Multi P L. However you spell that. So what does the multiplication look like if you have x1 y1 times x2 y2? Just off the top of my head, I think it's x1 x2 minus y1 y2, comma x1, y2 plus x2, y1. Yes, that's the multiplication. Hopefully it'll make sense in a minute. That's the weird complex multiplication. You can also write it as a plus bi such that a and B, of course, are real numbers. And I is probably best to write I squared is negative 1. So you can write it more simply like this. And you use your regular algebra rules to multiply. So what does multiplication look like here? A1 plus B1I, A2 plus B2I. So go ahead and we'll foil those out. Simplify it down, use the fact that i squared is negative 1, and write down what you get. Following the form of the five. No, don't look at that. Okay. Do this regular the regular way, yeah. Okay. Hopefully it simplifies to what's above, but I was just pulling that out of memory. So I should not have been surprised with A's and the B's that it worked out like that. B1, B2, I squared is negative B1, B2. So there's the weird multiplication written out the way that you're used to it being written. Although what I wrote at the top of the screen is exactly the same with a different notation. 
I just use parentheses instead of that little I notation. Okay, so that's the definition of complex numbers. We're, we can use either one. Our usual letters. That's like a four. For complex variables, my computer had a major update this morning. It took so long I couldn't even use it for an hour. But hopefully it's better. But it's been acting really weird and doing stuff like that. So we don't use x normally. We're going to use z's and w's a lot. So if z is a plus b i and w is, we'll go c plus d i. Let's see how many of these you remember. We just did the multiplication, so that should take two seconds. Yeah, the bottom one is z-bar, not half of a fraction. Known as a conjugate operator. change that setting on me today without telling me. So I probably wrote them in decreasing order of difficulty. The conjugate and the plus operator are very easy. So plus, you just add real parts, imaginary parts. Nothing special going on with the plus. Uh, the conjugate operator, what does that do to the number a plus bi? a squared minus b squared. You're thinking of, you're probably thinking of magnitude. Which, now that you're saying that, we might as well include that one as well. So the conjugate is a minus, is the conjugate of a plus b i. So it'll be a minus b i. And if b was already negative, that would make it positive. So if it would look like x minus 5 i, it would be x plus 5 i. That would be the conjugate operator. 
All right, magnitude is a squared plus b squared. Make sure you don't do a squared plus b. What happens if you do bi squared? A squared minus b squared. Yep, that would be a squared minus b squared. Very easy to get negatives out of that. So that is not your magnitude. So don't do magnitude like that. It's the coefficient of i, not <coughs> the actual i itself. This is the square root over that, right? The a squared is b squared? Square root of a squared. Oh yeah, no, it's definitely square rooted, yeah. So you'll have even more trouble because that could be a imaginary magnitude or a complex magnitude. And you're supposed to be measuring length, which should be not just a real number, but a real number that's zero or more. All right. Who remembers complex division? What we need is already on the board. So what we need to do is make the bottom real. So we're not allowed to just erase that thing. But if we multiply it by a conjugate, we will eliminate the uh, complex part. It'll turn into a different real number. And it will look like a scalar number times a complex number. So we're going to multiply by the conjugate c minus di. Now on the bottom, I'm going to exploit the conjugate multiplication, c squared plus d squared. And on the top, whatever you get when you FOIL out is the number you get on the top. And this just looks like 1 over c squared plus d squared times, uh, maybe I'll write it out here, ac plus bd plus i times something ac minus bd. Oh, it's a really good question. It's sort of c squared minus d squared. If I wrote the whole story in here without skipping steps, what is it? Oh, right, because it's the difference of squares to okay. So it is. You could write it like this. Di, it's minus di squared is really what it is. But yeah, when you square i, you get the negative one, which will cancel the other negative one. So if you write everything out, this is really what you get. It's minus the second term squared, which is actually plus d squared. I have a question about the i terms in the, when you FOIL ac, um, the last, the ac and the D. When, when you multiply the B and the D, wouldn't the I be gotten rid of? Yes. So this should be AC minus BIDI. Uh, no, I'm talking about the, in the next one over. That one, right? The A and B are I think one, uh, Oh, yeah. No, those letters are not paired up correctly. No, it should be A, D. Well, that's a negative term. Let's put the positive one first. B, C minus A, D. There we go. Keyboard really keeps popping up. <coughs> it's a good thing to reset the user settings every time you update. So we could summarize multiplication a lot nicer. Let's summarize it down here. What did we do? We multiplied by W. I'll write it out and then next to it, write all these things we're going to do. So
So ww bar is magnitude w squared. So that's operations we did written out much more succinctly. We just did all that stuff with uh, actual a, b, you know, x, y coefficients. Okay, we will look at the polar representation now, which was, so this was pretty much pre-calculus one in a nutshell, mm -hmm. the complex stuff from pre-cal one. Now we're gonna look at the complex stuff from pre-cal two, which is turn all this stuff into polars. So the complex plane has two axes. It has a real axis and it has a second axis, which technically it's a real axis, but it's, uh, it represents the imaginary part of the number. So we generally call it a real axis and an imaginary real axis. And if you have some number like 2, 3, you will go, or 2 plus 3i, you go over 2, up 3, that number, I'll use z, for the number is 2 plus 3i. So that would be the number represented in rectangular coordinates. And if we go to polar coordinates, I'll switch to blue. If we change the polar coordinates, we measure the same number, the same point, in a different way. We have a radius r and an angle theta. So you're basically aiming or picking a trajectory with theta, and then you're going out some amount with the radius. And there's two ways to write the form. The most efficient way is R E to the I theta. That's called, called Euler's. There's a, another way to write it out. R cos theta plus R sine theta, or plus I times R sine theta. And of course you factor your R out. And I called this the standard polar form, the one that was in your uh, pre-cal textbook. And this one comes right from measuring carefully the, or relating the quantities with trigonometry. And how do we relate this triangle? We got different sides here. We can figure out if we know r and theta, we can get the x and the y side by using sines and cosines. So we got sine, uh, this side right over here, y, and that side, x. x is r cos theta, y equals r sine theta. And then you just take out, um, that's just x plus i, y. That's all that's going on here. So there's all stuff from pre-cal class, which was beers ago, but still important now. So your book has a few weird, or not really weird, but functions that I want to describe. There are all things you've thought about before, just maybe not with this language. So I don't know if this book uses the CIS function. Where cis theta is cos theta plus i sine theta. I don't know if this book uses it, but somewhere along the way I ran into that. So you might see a cis function which stands for cosine imaginary sine, I think. So it's the cosine theta plus i times sine theta. Now, a new function your book will use is the arg function. And I'll write that on the left. So what R does, it just grabs the angle theta. Where theta is gonna be between zero and two pi.
So complex functions, we haven't looked too much at this. We've done a few operations, but complex functions, you could have an input that's complex. So you have e to the z. This is e to the a plus b i. And using the algebra that we know is e to the a, e to the b i. And if we think about this in polar form, the first part right here is the radius. And up here, that b itself is the angle. If you think in the r e to the i theta form, e to the a takes the place of r, and b takes the place of theta. So let's keep going with calculus stuff we know. Well, we haven't done any calculus on imaginary stuff, imaginary functions yet. We did the Taylor series expansions way back in Calc 2. And Taylor series expansion of e to the x. One plus x plus x squared over two factorial And if you want to complete the pattern, you can do a one factorial here, and it's a little strange. You can do a zero factorial, which was defined to be one, not zero. So there is e to the x in the Taylor series expansion. And this is summation x to the k over k factorial k equals 0 to infinity. So that's e to the x expanded. And we're going to replace x by z. So e to the z is z to the k so you can do Taylor for any function that you can take derivatives on the Taylor series might not have a nice pattern happening but for most of the functions that we tried, the Taylor series did have a nice pattern, or at least a relatively nice pattern. And we're going to write the one for sine and cosine now. So sine is summation z to the 2k minus 1 over 2k minus 1 factorial times negative 1 to the k minus 1. k equals 1 to infinity. I don't expect you to have this memorized. They're somewhere around chapter 10 in your textbook. So there was sine, cosine. It's similar, except it's all the evens. So it's z to the 2k. 2k factorial, negative 1 to the k. And this one starts out k equals 0 to infinity. So I don't expect you to have these memorized already. But it should. No, I don't, I don't think you'll need. Well, we'll see what we need. But you should at least be aware that they existed at some point in calc 2 or calc 3. All right, so that, these are alternative ways to think about e to the z, sine of z, and cosine of z.
So we have, as of yet, we haven't fed any imaginary values to any trig functions. We've multiplied some imaginary values, taken them to some powers, including roots, as well as integer powers. We've added, subtracted, but we haven't fed them into trig functions yet. So the way we're going to do it is we're going to do it by using the uh, expansions that we have right here on the board. So write this first expansion out, the one for sine, except z is equal to i now and figure out if you can simplify this at all. Plugging it in is easy. We just replace z by i. That's not anything more fancy than just writing it down again, swapping out a letter. But what we have to do is simplify i to the 2k minus 1. How in the world do we do that? So we know k is starting at 1. k is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let's just figure out when k is 1, 2, 3, and 4 and then maybe we'll be smart enough to see a pattern. So let's write out the terms when k is 1, 2, 3, and 4. 